Man, I really hate the Daily Mail because I want to talk about the Tories, but they've got some woman here and they're talking about her ass, so it's really distracting me. Tories reselect two MEP candidates who support a second referendum for the European elections, despite their calls for Brexit to be cancelled. I mean, do they understand the mood of the country? What are they doing? It's like the Conservative Party has just given up. What are they thinking? Why would they do this? I mean, it's hardly that there is going to be some kind of deep, <laughs> deep forgiveness that the public are going to give to the Tory party anyway for the way they've handled Brexit. And now that we have to have MEP elections, the EU is expecting to be deluged by Brexiteer MPs, and essentially not just from Britain, but like Eurosceptic MPs from ac across the continent. Because everyone's watched how they conducted this. Theresa May gave them all the decision-making power, all of it, and the EU just abused that. The EU has humiliated Britain time after time after time. And Theresa May has just gone crawling back every single time. And it's just like, why? Why on earth would anyone outside of this situation look at this and go, you know what? This is actually pretty good. I think this is great. I'm very happy with this. Unless they were emotionally committed to the European Union. I see this all the time. It's crazy. I've got friends who I know that they still like me and I know I still like them. But, like, they will they will literally say, no, no, dude, I'm, like, I've become, like, hardcore Remain, where I think that the European Union is the first step on the, the, the first stage on the, the step, the path to a global super state. And I'm just like, man, I can't imagine anything worse than that. I can't imagine anything that could be less well held to account than sending politicians on behalf of all the nations of the world to a single parliament. I mean, imagine some of the awful people you're going to have to share that with. I mean, the UN is bad enough. If the UN is going to be a model for anything like that, the UN is bad enough. Because if you look at, like, Saudi Arabia is on the Human Rights Commission. <laughs> They're the ones talking about women's rights. It's insane. I, I just can't, I can't imagine why anyone would think a, a global world ruled by a centralized state is wise. And God only knows the damage that such power could do to any group of people had they the inclination. I mean, just it's really scary that there are people that want that. But I've I have friends, not just one either. I know there's gonna be one guy who's thinking, hey, he's talking about me. No, I have lots of friends who think this. And because it, it seems that these sort of hardcore remainers are really coalescing into quite a radical block in the same way and i'm not you know i'm not saying that i'm exempt from this the hardcore brexiteers are doing the same and i am a hardcore brexiteer and i recognize this and so i can recognize that we have become incredibly polarized and to extremes and i've asked my uh remainer friends to come out and talk to me about this i'll be hosting an event on the 22nd in swindon town center where i'll have a table two chairs and a microphone I'll be talking to people, just calm conversations about things on which we fundamentally disagree. And I'm going to try and get to the bottom of these things with them, because I think this is important. But uh, in the meantime, the Conservative Party seems to be just willingly just chopping parts of itself off. And I don't like they've, they've just given up. And I'll tell you what, right, if you're a Conservative, don't go for the Brexit Party. I'll tell you why as well, right? A, Nigel Farage has gone back on everything that he said about everything other than Brexit. He seems to have completely bent the knee to the London media. And if there's one thing you should never do, it's apologise to the London media. Because I'm telling you, man, they're not they're, you are their useful tool until they feel that they're strong enough to get rid of you. And when, when the time comes, man, Nigel, you've got your fair share of quite surprising things to say about Islam and social justice this gay you know whatever all that sort of stuff so they'll just come and batter you with that when they're ready for now they're just afraid of ukip because ukip isn't afraid of them ukip is more than happy to start sticking it to them and we are and they're they're genuinely worried about this i think that there may have been some fixed polling as well because i've spoken to lots of people who don't even know nigel farage has left ukip let alone started a new party but hey he's got a lot of money he's got uh He's got the uh, the mainstream media, which are surprisingly on his side now, which is really weird. How they're 
promoting him now that UKIP have become effectively radical and gone off the gone off gone rogue on the media. The media cannot use their moral standards to control UKIP, and so they're afraid. And so suddenly, oh, oh, the Brexit party is very good. Nigel Farage is a very honourable man. I mean, don't don't just ignore the last you know what five years of us calling him a Nazi. You <laughs> don't worry about that. A racist, xenophobic Nazi. Blah 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 blah. So, no, no, no. Nigel Farage is the man of the mainstream media now. I say, okay, well, fine. That's that's your choice. But you're going to be stuck in exactly the same position because at the end of the day, they haven't got any MP candidates. They're not going to be running local elections. They're not. I mean, how many European candidates do they even have? It seems that the party is just made up of Nigel Farage, and everyone else is subscribing to it. So, it's like, okay, well, fine. You know, that's. I guess we'll see how that goes. But the Conservatives are going to pancake come the next general election and even local elections as well my god you know you that is where ukip is going to absolutely clean up because the alternatives will be the conservatives labor or lib dems so remainers remainers or remainers man i, I you, you like the the future of britain is very is going to be very confusing it's it, honestly i and things i don't even know what's exa- i don't know what's going to happen but i think that like the situation is genuinely like it's every it's all change it's all change and the conservatives could have preserved their position had they not decided that they were going to just let the european union be the ones who decided if if they had taken the sort of moral moral step forward and said right we have a mandate an unimpeachable moral mandate to leave the european union there are many good moral arguments there are many good economic arguments and we are going to side with those and just push on for the sake of the country, then their party, which they were trying to protect, wouldn't be falling apart. And all I'm saying is, every single one of these will completely cuck. I mean, look at what Jacob Rees-Mogg said the other day. You can't make anti-Islamophobic countries that, uh, comments in this country. They have no place in this country. Why Islam, Mr. Catholic? Why are you singling out Islam to be the privileged religion that we cannot criticize why can't we just not criticize any religion and then when you get to it you'd be like well hang on a second that's the complete opposite of the british value of tolerance and skepticism so what you what you mean is every religion can be criticized so we should be free to criticize islam and make anti-islam comments i mean are we supposed to are we dimmies now mr mark are we supposed to like it but i guess you've joined farage and all the others going well god there's literally a load of stuff we can't talk about but you kept don't feel that way you can feel that they can talk about it. You can feel that they have the liberty to talk about it, and they should have the liberty to talk about it. And they're going to keep growing. You may think, well, look at, like, right this second, it's not great. Yeah, I know, but just watch us. Anyway, two MEPs who have been campaigning for a second referendum, not a popular position, by the way, only popular with the hardcore Remainers, but carry on, have been reselected as candidates for the Conservative Party. A uh, former Liberal Democrat and uh, Conservative People's Vote campaign will be on the ballot paper in London. Now, in London, they might do okay, but this is not going to impress the rest of the country when the Conservatives do this. Like, it, these things have ripples outside of where the immediate area that they, in which they take place. These things have an impact. For some reason, the Conservatives, though, are just going for it. I mean, look, look at this. Look at this, right? Every single region of England and Wales is happy to leave the EU without a deal. My position, the hardcore Brexit position, and most of the country supports it, except London, where the two Remainers are standing. Do you guys think that the rest of the country doesn't see what happens in London? I mean, we are bombarded on a daily basis by the London-centric media. You know, the ones currently punching down against me. The London-centric media have this... Like they, they have this belief that they are in control of everything. But if you look at where they are rated on any any kind of public rating system, they it's catastrophic. Everyone hates the coverage they produce. It's just they are the only media that they had. Well, that's changing, isn't it? I mean, the fact that you're watching this here shows that this is changing. It's not going to be like this going into the future. But I mean, honestly, like, oh, I'm not even logged in. I actually do have a, a Telegraph account, but I'm not going to log in. But anyway... And it's getting so bad. That, I mean, literally, it just looks like the Conservatives are giving up. The Derbyshire Tories are just not even taking part in the EU elections. Outside of London, they are going to get absolutely slaughtered. Just massacred. And it's not like UKIP haven't been putting down some good roots in the North as well. 
you know, we've been doing the Northern Tour, we've been getting some good, really good responses. And I bet this, I bet this has really helped. I hope it's helped. I mean, I mean, what else could we have done? You know, we've been producing a lot of good media. We've got some really committed activists at this point. And the party's hit 30,000 people as far as I'm aware. So it's not like we're doing badly, all things considered, since we are the the utter and quintessential outsiders to the sort of politically correct order that the Conservatives and the Brexit Party seem to want to bend the knee to. Not having it. But, I mean, literally, they've just announced they won't be taking part in the upcoming EU elections. I mean, they say that they're furious that Theresa May has failed to deliver and that these elections are even going ahead, which I'm sure is I'm sure is true. I mean, I'm sure maybe maybe these are Brexiteers. But they're just not even going to bother. They're not even going to say, right, I'm going to go there as a Conservative Brexiteer. Nope. Because they know the brand is going to be toxic. They know that when the people are going to the vote, they're going to be like, fuck the Conservatives. Fuck them. And, I mean, obviously these people aren't voting for Labour, so they're going elsewhere. It's all to play for. It's all I'm saying. This was not an easy decision to take, and it goes against every natural instinct we have as Conservatives to support our hard-working MEPs and candidates. However, we promised, we were promised, following the largest public mandate the UK government has ever received, that would be out by March 29th. The Prime Minister said we'd be out by that date countless times, so did many others in the government, yet we are here racing towards the end of April, facing an increased prospect of participating in the European election in May, and that should not be happening. More significantly for our... And we are doing that, by the way. It's all on. Uh, how old is this? It's only a couple of days old. But it's definitely on. It's definitely on. Um, more significantly for our residents and local businesses, the fact the uncertainty continues. And that's a, that is actually a fine point. The uncertainty is what's killing everyone. You know, the uncertainty is the thing that's costing money because people don't know how to prepare. Businesses can prepare for this if they just know what's happening. But they don't know what's happening, so what are they going to prepare for? Whether you voted to leave or remain, the vast majority of people recognise there is a democratic obligation to deliver what was promised, and the government should not abdicate their promise to deliver it. Yes, why can't Theresa May just do that? And, instead, why is she going sucking up to Jeremy Corbyn, the communist sympathisers, the terrorist sympathisers, the anti, anti-British anti activists, the, the people in Labour who just hate this country... Why is she sucking up to them? She could have operated from a position of supreme strength by taking ownership of the fact that there was a democratic mandate and saying, right, it's no deal and or nothing, and I don't care. You know, I don't care. I'm standing by it. I mean, my God, she would have had half the country singing her praises. She would have been Theresa Mayhem, the mad lad prime minister who's just going to stick it to the EU. Man, I tell you what, if I were in charge, this is exactly what would have happened. It would have been glorious. And be like, oh, but it would have cost some money. Yeah, well, you know, everything costs some money. But it is better in principle to be out of the European Union. And that's what we should have done. And I'll tell you what, right, there's, there's interesting as well is how things are going with the Brexiteer factions. So I, I was listening to this podcast with Godfrey Bloom, who uh, was an ex-UKIP uh, MEP, who got, um, he got castigated when UKIP still cared about what the mainstream media thought. And man, he was not kind to Nigel in this. He, I mean, literally called him a woman for squabbling with Jared Batten. Because, I mean, Jared and Nigel have had a 25-year history, and obviously I'm a Jared partisan at this point. Um, but, I mean, it's not like Nigel doesn't have some really great qualities, you know? And it's Jared Batten's got his own really great qualities, and apparently they've never liked each other, and this is something. This is a thing I've heard time and time and time and time again, and exactly as Godfrey says here, Nigel does not share platforms. So it's Nigel's ego which is the upper-class Tory boy that he was before he joined UKIP, versus Jared Batten's uh, working-class, I-won't-be-spoken-to-like-that attitude. Because Batten really has earned his nickname of Bulldog. He really is. He's, he does not back down. And Farage does not share platforms. So it really is a massive clash of egos. And I, I honestly, I'm at the point where there, I really don't think there's any reconciling any of this. So I would... I mean, I don't like attacking Nigel. I don't like knocking him or teasing him. I have done a few times, probably like, you know, six times or something. And it's always been fairly lighthearted. And I don't consider this to be a political attack either. I think this is just a fair analysis of what's going on. But I don't think there's any, any, <laughs> any, <laughs> any reconciling this still. The idea is just, it's ludicrous to me. And I really think that UKIP and the Brexit party should just ignore one another. Just go out, argue your points. <laughs> the Brexit party purely for Brexit, because they can't talk about anything else. But UKIP have a full spectrum of issues that they're prepared to talk about. 
obviously Brexit. I mean, what the, the, the organising principle of UKIP is Brexit, but it is also to promote British values. That's not something that the Brexit Party will do. They will not ad address any of the other problems in this country. And we can say, well, Brexit's the most important problem. Yeah, okay, but the other problems are still happening. You know, we can't just ignore them. And at the end of the day, even if the Brexit Party won every single MEP slot in the country, what can they do? All they can do is, like, sit there and bitch out um, Jean-Claude Juncker in the Parliament. They, they have no power in this country, really, because they don't get to set any of the rules from Europe that come down to Britain. They just get to rubber stamp everything or block as they feel fit. I mean, don't get me wrong, it would be nice to have all of this stuff blocked so they're just not telling us what to do, but that's a, that's a temporary strategy, isn't it? That's just a delaying mechanism. You can't beat the EU from within the inside. And so, I mean, you know, if, I, if, if for some reason I end up getting elected by some miracle, because I really should... I, really shouldn't have any kind of chance i don't think but if by some reason uh, for some reason i get elected then i'll i'll go there and just use the minuscule amount of power i have as an mep essentially as a bully pulpit just to tell them how i feel about them and i wish how how they would actually understand themselves to look and appear from the perspective of someone who doesn't already buy into their narratives but um but yeah anyway so the campaign is afoot I'll see you in Swindon on the 22nd and on the 23rd in Bristol. That'll be where it's actually going to get spicy because Bristol is bloody well Antifa central. And, uh, and I think they'll probably end up turning up, won't they? And uh, after that, I'll be going to Gibraltar. I imagine I'll be the only MEP candidate going to Gibraltar. I'll be on the 25th to the 28th and I'll be in the... Uh, I can't remember the name of the town square, but there's a town square in Gibraltar on the 27th at 3 p.m., and I'd like to talk to people there, because I have a funny feeling, I've been doing a bit of re researching into this, and imagine what Jeremy Corbyn's going to do with Gibraltar if he becomes Prime Minister. He isn't talking about a huge amount, because the Rock of Gibraltar isn't exactly a massive issue in Britain, but he has been asked about it, and he said, no, I'm not going to fight for Gibraltar. I will not fight over it. I think we should just talk. And it's like, well, that's great, Jeremy. But when we're invaded by someone like Argentina or Spain, and they try to take it from us by force... We have a moral obligation to defend our sovereign territory. That's it. End of story. We must be strong on this point. And at the end of the day, to people in Gibraltar, man, we've come to a point where it's like, I know you guys voted to remain because of, you know, your strategic location, but it, it just is not going to get any better if you carry on adopting a remain position. The European Union will not respect you. In fact, they will resent you because you are British and they will hate you for it, even though you voted remain. And they're going to treat you that way. They're going to assume that you want to become a province of Spain and because you are joining the European Union. And this is what would have happened to Scotland had they stayed too. You'll just get subsumed into this giant European soup state over which you have absolutely no control or influence. And there will be no particular incentive for them to listen to you at all. So anyway, the campaigning is afoot. The the game is afoot. We're going we're going to go over the top. We are literally going to blow the fucking whistles. We are going to fix bayonets and we're going to charge some goddamn commies. See you there. <laughs>